about remembering and reflecting, but it is also about looking forward even as we look to the past. And so I'm delighted this evening to introduce our speaker, whom we bring to you in partnership with the Jewish Book Council. Jory Epstein is the author of The Upstander and a sports reporter for USA Today. At USA Today, she reports features, investigations, and news primarily on the Dallas Cowboys and the NFL. Jory graduated from the University of Texas in 2016 with degrees in journalism and Plan 2 honors. She's passionate about running, learning, and embracing obscure Jewish traditions. So just keep that in mind because you'll have a chance to ask her some questions later. And our moderator this evening is David Epstein, a lawyer, author, and self-described conversationalist. But his favorite relevant credentials, he says, are that he has always asked substantive questions. As a lawyer, he worked in trial advocacy, including as assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia. David co-authored Torah with Love, a guide for strengthening Jewish values within the family, which details how to have substantive conversations. And speaking of family, he also happens to be Jory's great uncle. Jory's book, The Upstander, is an inspiring reminder to all of us that we share a collective responsibility toward the victims and survivors of the Holocaust. We are the keepers and preservers of their stories. And at its very heart, her book is about the power and potential of relationships to make a difference. Following Jory and David's conversation in just a few moments, uh, you will have the opportunity to meet her in person. You will actually also have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of their, their talk. And she will be signing books in Krieger Lobby, which will be available for purchase at our conclusion. We also invite you, as you had, may have seen on the, at, towards the end of the service booklet, as you exit the sanctuary on your way later this evening, we invite you to take a tulip bulb with you, um, a sign of a friendship, a sign of commitment to creating and building together a better world, and I think for us tonight as well, a sign of how to be an upstander. So we thank Jory and David for being here with us in, in one of those words that in Jewish tradition we can only describe as beshert. Uh, I learned tonight from uh, my dear friend Rosalind Sprayregan Spray and from Paul that, uh, that Rosalind actually introduced David to his wife Ellen and they were married here 50 years ago in Freed Youth Wing where Rosalind was sharing her story with our confirmation class. So there's a way that things connect. Uh, I'm delighted to have Jory here with us. We've been looking forward to this opportunity since I heard her speak back in May at our Jewish Book Council uh, conference. And, uh, and to have them here together is really such a delight to be able to experience that conversation that we will be, uh, be able to participate in. And we invite you uh, to listen carefully, to think of those questions, and to think about uh, the message that they share through their conversation. So David and Jory, thank you, uh, and we invite you to join us on the BIMA. Thank you. Uh, the rabbi's already given away the first question uh, I wanted to ask Jory, and that is, is it a coincidence that our last name is Epstein? But uh, the Washington Post, whenever it publishes an article about Amazon, always puts in, in, in parentheses, uh, the newspaper, the Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. So uh, Jory, is it a coincidence that our last name is Epstein? It is not. <laughs> As Rabbi Shankman shared, um, this is my great uncle David, and it's so special for several reasons to be having this conversation, and among them because when Max and I set out to write The Upstander, we wanted this to be an intergenerational conversation, but really inspiring our millennial generation, and so I'm glad we can illustrate that here tonight. We certainly are intergenerational. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the other thing is uh, that's curious is that... Uh, Jory is a sports writer, and she has, uh, since uh, high school, I think, 
but in her college years, and now she's worked for Sports Illustrated, for the Dallas Morning News, and is now with the USA Today, uh, covering the National Football League, and in particular, the Dallas Cowboys. I have to tell you, Jory, that several decades ago, when the Dallas Cowboys played the Washington football team, that was one of the big events in sports in Washington, not so much in recent years since the uh, Dallas team has fared somewhat better than the Washington football team. But Jory, how do you uh, go from being a sports writer, uh, where you're covering uh, men who are engaged in a very competitive, uh, high energy sport, but paid quite well, and choose this particular kind of uh, sport to, to compete in and to excel in, to uh, uh, going into writing a uh, what I call an acclaimed book. It's it's uh, and that's not the family talk. My family ties talking. It really, if you read what others have said about the book, you will find out that uh, it it really hits home. How do you how do you what's the connection between being a sports writer and being a uh, uh, writing a book about a Holocaust survivor? Yeah, I think for me, I'm passionate about understanding who people are, what their stories are, and how we tell them. And while I would never equate uh, Max's experiences in the Holocaust and the testimony he's inspired us by sharing with the stories of the players I'm working with in the NFL, I think at its core, they're all experiencing very human experiences, and it's our job, how do we understand them and use them to better understand who we are and what it means for our society? Um, that's not exactly how I ended up in this story, but I, I, I think that the passions really translate. Um, but I, I actually met Max initially, or really got to know him in 2012 on a Holocaust Remembrance and Education program called March of the Living. So along with my high school classmates at the time, we traveled to the concentration camps in Poland at, with Max sharing his testimony with us. And I remember distinctly sitting on the wooden floors of the barracks in Majdanek, which was the camp to which Max was deported to. Um, it's ultimately where his mother and brother were murdered and shortly after his father at a nearby labor camp. And Max is telling us, as we're sitting here now in 2012, decades later, um, a story about how he think one of the reasons he thinks he survived, which is that um, he convinced one of the heads of a carpentry shop to let him work rather than just sweep the floors. And for the Nazis, if you were valuable for work, that was enough to be valuable for life. And as Max is telling us this story of almost a moment of chutzpah is what we would describe it as today, where he was like, I think I can do better what you're trying to do. Um, which if you know Max today at 93 years old, he still might say something like that. But I, I, he, he mentioned at the end, he said, I don't think I've ever told anyone that before. And Max had shared the, some of the details of the story, but every time he shares his testimony, though incredibly at 93, it's still consistent. Um, he remembers different details at different times, particularly when he goes back to the concentration camps. And I think that's really when it, it clicked for me that maybe he hadn't told this story before, but we need to make sure that, particularly for my generation, it's heard again. Well, how old were you when you first encountered Max and, and listened to the story and, and had this reaction? At that time, I was 17, and we, we definitely were not talking about partnering in any specific way, much less writing a book. Right. And you, uh, you kept that memory going forward? Yeah, I think, I think I kept it, actually. And among the many Beshert experiences I had at the University of Texas in the coming years, I had a professor that first semester I was at UT. I had mentioned this trip in passing, and she goes, well, have you wrote down what he said, and have you wrote it down digitally and sort of digested your thoughts because this is really important. And I give her so much credit. Um, she was, she's not Jewish, but I think as we see tonight, this isn't just a Jewish story. This is a story of humanity. Um, and she really encouraged me to digitize what Max had said. And I took my notebook where I had been trying to write down Max's memories and his messages and created it into a digital file, which four years later would become some of the starting points for my conversations with now, You mentioned UT. Uh, not everybody here is from Texas. Uh, UT is the University of Texas uh, in Austin. Jory grew up in Dallas. And um, Jory, so when you, four years later, you're still thinking about Max's story and you're pursuing your education and also your sports interests. Yeah. And what, 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 what was the click 
in terms of a triggering event, as I like to call it, that got you into writing his story rather than just thinking about his story. Absolutely. Again, I would, I would not say that this was on my mind at all during college, um, but going back to one of the words we used earlier tonight, Basher, which is the Jewish word for destiny, the first weekend I was home when I moved back to Dallas, I saw Max at our synagogue, and he mentioned to me that he had just received um, some new documents from the Red Cross from Germany. And so he now had some of the documentation of I think there was his father's newspaper in there, a Yiddish copy, some of his transfer papers between the concentration camps. We had incredibly the social worker papers from 1947 the, in the few, first few days that he arrived in America. And what I think Max realized is these stories and these memories that he had been sharing for decades, he now also had a paper trail of, and, and it was lining up and he was considering turning his testimony into a book beyond the lectures. You make the observation in your book that the Nazis uh, kept very good records. How did that, uh, even while doing the most evil acts, how, how does that uh, figure into your story? Yeah, it's helpful because again, um, it's been, I mean, it, that, the Holocaust ended in 1945. We're now in 2021. And for some reason, facing questions at some point about how and whether this occurred. And when we have this documentation, I think it really verifies it. And so my job, went, to, to back up for a minute, so Max and I are having this conversation at synagogue, and I almost half-jokingly, not really a joke, but not really expecting it to happen, said, well, well, maybe I should write your book, Max. I just finished a thesis, and I start mentioning to him some of this. And then later that summer, we see each other again at the fitness center. Max, walking around the track, mentions that someone at the Holocaust Museum had recommended he turn his testimony into a book. And again, not fully serious or expecting. I said, well, I thought I was writing your book, Max. And Max doesn't miss a beat and says, that's what I told him. <laughs> so there was, was that audacity on your part or, or just you were, com you were at a comfort level that I can handle one of the most uh, extraordinary stories of the century, any Holocaust survivor story is, falls into that category. Uh, yeah, I think I was neither at a comfort level then, nor am I at it now. And I think <laughs> I still don't really know what I've gotten myself into. But what amazes me is that, one, how Max has supported me through this. And really, what I think is so powerful, Max's testimony is powerful. But if you meet him and if you read The Upstander, you'll see it's not just the content of his testimony that's powerful. It's the warmth, the humor, just the way he invites you in and makes you feel like you're his friend, your daughter, your granddaughter. And I think when Max allowed me into his story, it allowed me to invite readers into his testimony. Some years ago, Herman Wouk, the novelist, said that he had had a conversation with S.Y. Agnon, the Nobel laureate in, in Hebrew, also a novelist. And, and Agnon had said, the most important thing in writing a story is paint pictures. Now, you did paint many pictures, but you decided, how is this book different than many other books that have been written or many other memories? And Rosalind Spryregan, who was mentioned and who spoke to the confirmation class, uh, has a different story. H how is your book different? Yeah, it's a great question, and it, it's fascinating you bring that up because Max had four goals when we set out to write this book, which, again, amazes me that in his late 80s, he, he has these clear goals for everything and doesn't miss a beat. Uh, I hope I can be th have that mental clarity at his age. And one of his goals was, he said, when I lecture, I speak and I create pictures in people's mind, and I want to make sure that the memoir does that too. So he wanted these vivid, this vivid imagery. He wanted to make sure that his book didn't create further hate, um, and that really it wasn't so long or academic that it couldn't invite people in and make what's an inaccessible topic to understand accessible to start thinking about. And so when, when we decided, I mean, it was really trying to break it up piece by piece, okay? Let's talk about Max's ghetto experiences because Max was smuggling as a teenager to help feed his family in the ghetto. Okay, let's understand what was going on after Max was orphaned in the concentration camps. But now let's back up and understand Max's childhood because we there, there's so much meaning in so many of the books that do only talk about the warriors. 
but I felt like for my generation, as we're trying to understand and process that this actually happened, if we can understand how similar Max's childhood was to our childhood, to our siblings, to our kids and grandkids as we grow up, then maybe we can start to reckon with this Max who, a few chapters into the book, feels like he could be one of our friends or family members, actually experienced this. Um, so we really tried to recreate his earlier years, too. Well, that is one of the uh, distinctive features of your book, is that it's not just about the Holocaust. There's, there's his childhood. Now, keep in mind, he was 11 years old when the, when the, when the, uh, the Germans invaded Poland in 1939, he was born in 1928. Uh, if we can imagine our children or grandchildren who are 11 years old and for the next five years having to deal, six years having to deal with this kind of world, how, how do you put your mind around the fact that here's a, a child in adolescence having to deal with, with survival and could have been shot at any moment, the way you describe it in the book? Right. No. I, I can't fully reckon with it, but what I think it, Max realizes is, one, there's a degree of luck involved in his survival, and that doesn't demean or belittle what he did to survive, um, but we can just appreciate that and, I guess, thank God for it. Um, Max prides himself on how he was feisty and trying to create new ways, whether it was to smuggle and save food for his family or to otherwise um, outsmart the Germans, but I really think... And then also, I think Max was very honest about... There's so much going on at that point when you're allotted 184 calories a day, like two apples, that you can't process everything. And so I think he was really honest about the emotions he was experiencing and also honest about the emotions that you can't experience when that degree of shock is hitting you over and over and over again. What was there in his pre-war childhood that signaled that Max was a, had the, the uh, capabilities and the, and the wit to survive, was there something that you found in his pre-war story? Yeah, again, I think we can't discount just good the, a degree of good fortune, but there definitely was, Max was mischievous, um, which was important as he was trying to constantly reinvent how he would survive. And also from a technical standpoint, he was really good at woodworking when he was a child. So he would create these wooden structures at his school. He, he's very proud that he always got the top grade five out of five on them. And ultimately that was the skill, the, the, the skilled labor that he would do during the camps. And he persuaded a, a Nazi uh, head of the department that, that he could, even though he had no formal training, that, that he could be a pattern maker for, for German airplanes. Absolutely. And I think, again, that whether it's the chutzpah or just the confidence, he was so determined to survive that whatever he needed to do, he was going to figure it out. Now, in reading the book, it seemed, first of all, I, I, uh, there's a famous phrase, if I'd had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. You wrote a short book. How many pages is it in print? 190, I believe. 190. Uh, that's more likely to be read. Who's your audience? Yeah, it's a great question. We wanted a memoir that was both accessible and meaningful for adults, but also could connect with middle school, high school students, university students, because there are schools that include the Holocaust in their curriculum. And what we thought is, and it's not that we don't want to understand what happened during the war, it's important to, but rather than have a comprehensive history of the Holocaust, which I am not credentialed to write, and thank God people have done that. We wanted to understand one man's life story before, during, and after the war, and how this just unbelievable chapter of history can impact someone and will always impact him, his, his uh, children, his grandchildren, and those of us around for the rest of our life as we try and reckon with the trauma. Well, could you, uh, your book has many different aspects of his life. Could you break it down into sections like his pre-war childhood? And then what happens after that? Yeah, we did. It was really, what was, who was Max the child and what anti-Semitism was he already experienced, when, experiencing when he's 10 years old, having rocks thrown at him, being called names, having his hat snatched just because he was Jewish. And then when you get into the ghetto years, how is Max, when he's still with his family, trying to really step up again at 11, 12, 13 years old to help his family survive, which I can't imagine doing now, much less at that age, um, the, the during the war experience. And then we, we go extensively into what it's like after the war because 
When Max has liberated in 1945, he's now 17 years old. He has no job. He has no formal education after the age of, I think, I guess roughly 11. Um, no family. He doesn't speak German or English, which is the countries that he's going to. And he has to figure out how to fend for himself while wondering when he gets to this next country, are people going to hate him again? Are they going to try to kill him again? Uh, will he be able, he wanted to go back to school, but he didn't, he, he was realistic that he's like, I don't think I can focus on classes when I feel like I need to know I can survive. And ultimately when I want to start a family, how can I risk loving again after what I've lost? Which I think is, is just so powerful and heart wrenching. And I think ultimately though, what Max experienced during the Holocaust is just so troubling. I was actually really sh shaken by what he continues to experience, the nightmares he continues to have, and how the Holocaust and his survival of it still impacts his relationships with his children. Uh, so you take him through the, the Holocaust and the horrors, and from the way you describe it, he could have been shot at any moment and nothing uh, by, by any guard or anybody else, and of course there are no consequences for shooting a Jew in, in a concentration camp. Uh, the war ends, and he survived. His family's gone. What does he do next? Yeah, so Max actually first spent the night, like immediately April 23rd, 1945, when they were liber liberated by the Allied forces. He and a, a few other prisoners who had made this death march from, they were started at the concentration camp of Flossenburg, were headed to the death camp of Dachau, but never made it there. Um, they actually spend the night at a local woman's house who was making them food down the street and giving them a place to sleep. And then she said, look, I want to help you, but I think my neighbors are going to come after me if I do. So he was trying to hitchhike for a little bit. Ultimately, they were picked up by a, lieutenant, a Jewish lieutenant in the American army, and he becomes, um, I guess, a mess sergeant in, for German POWs in a camp um, in Nur near Nuremberg. And so he's been starting to learn English. Um, he'll tell you he made some great geese dinners for the POWs there. Um, that's one of my favorite stories in the book when Max, who neither had formal cooking experience nor driving experience, is driving through these fields with all of these like balking geese, trying to figure out how to get food on the table for dinner. And again, I think that that story kind of reflects why Max allows us into his testimony because he's interspersing that with the traumas he's endured. Um, and then he ultimately came to America um, really while technically chaperoning young babies who were getting in under um, an orphan act in December, 1947. And by before the new year, he was in Atlanta in a foster home. And while he was uh, in your book, there, there are certain questions you ask that he says, I, I won't answer. Some he changes his mind on and others he never changes his mind on. What are those, what's the category of those questions that he won't answer? Yeah, something Max, I remember telling him, telling us this when we were at the camps with him in high school. And one of his lines was, pain can't be duplicated, so why share it? And I think that everyone has a different philosophy on this, but Max wants to make sure that any part of his testimony he's recounting has a chance to help someone because if not he doesn't want someone to be angry from it and hate on account of it and he doesn't want to just upset people or traumatize them he doesn't believe that that's that's not his view of holocaust education um, but one thing we talked about was actually um, what we believe was when max was sexually abused in the camps and he had never shared this before before this book and i remember when we first started to broach that topic um, I didn't know exactly where Max was, was going. I just knew, we, we knew he had gone in, into a room in a barrack in the camps. And um, he starts to say, and this is probably 2017 now, and he says, actually, I don't want to talk about this. And, and I respected that. And then a few months later, Max decided, almost whispering to me at his dining room table, that he wanted to, to share this with me. But he didn't want it to go in the book because he hadn't really spoken with his wife about it, with his children. And he's like, I don't know if they're going to view me differently if they understand this dimension of what I've went through, which is different than the, than the testimony I'd been sharing. Um, and then I remember sitting at the Dallas Holocaust Museum in June 2018 when Max, it, there was a, the Me Too movement was in um, the news a lot then. And Max said, I've seen how some of these women coming forward, sharing their story has an has really started to hold people accountable and inspire others. And I want to, if I can c convince one person reading this book not to 
assault or abuse someone who was going to, that's worth it. And then Max also says that he, he's like, I feel like we all have these compartments, he says, um, with our, what's may, maybe something we're ashamed of. Although again, of course, I would never say he should be ashamed, but he did feel shame. Um, and things that he, we, we haven't shared. And Max says, I don't want to leave this world without sharing something if it could be helpful for someone. And that was so powerful to me because while the Me Too movement has had many incredible impacts, I, would, I don't think when we think about the impacts it's made, we're thinking about a 93-year-old man sharing his testimony and being able to take this weight off his chest, but that was the impact it had on Max. And, and does, uh, he has a philosophy about what, what he's doing and why he's doing it. Could you elaborate on what his thinking is and, and is it, um, how do you show that, that reading his story is, can be effective in achieving his goal? Yeah, I think that Max has lectured for decades. We've seen the impact he has had in helping um, really inspire people. Because for Max, this isn't only about remembering the Holocaust. That's certainly where it starts, but not where it ends. Where we continue beyond that is where Max says, I want us to understand the depths to which humanity can sink so that we can understand in concert the potential we each have to stand up for what's good. Um, Max has an analogy he likes to share of a car wash, he says he believes that each of us are born in our brains with um, just sort I guess, inclinations and chances to do good and to do bad, or put another way with the title of our book, to be an upstander or to be a bystander, and that Max wants this book and the Holocaust Museum to take you through this car wash, eliminate the bad, eliminate the bystander tendencies, and only leave the good. And so Max believes if he can show you that humanity is stronger and more resilient than we think we are, and that we can stand up against this, then we won't have instances of some of the bystanders who, who were factors in what Max experienced in the murder that his family and six million Jews and millions of others experienced. Do you get any feedback that suggests that for people who don't know about the Holocaust or who make certain assumptions uh, are in fact uh, touched by knowing about Max's story either in person or through your book? We have, thank God. I mean, um, it's funny, on Amazon we can see sort of the different states and cities where the book has been purchased and Max loves hearing about it because he's like, I, who, I didn't know someone in Portland, Oregon would be reading my testimony and I didn't know this. Although he, he says he wants to sell a million copies, which I'm like, we're, we're working on it, Max. But, um, but yeah, we really have. And I think, again, what disarms people when they meet Max in person or hear him speak, which we, we think the book does the same, is that this isn't a story that feels so foreign and upsetting. And so because of that, We've heard from people who have experienced traumas of different ways who ultimately feel like, well, if Max can make it through this, so can I. And it really is a source of strength to them. Now, Max says in your book that he tries to, uh, he doesn't say it quite this way, but he's trying to inoculate people against hate or to remove hate. What, what does he understand to be hate? And, and, and what, does it, what does it mean in terms of the people who tormented him? Like, I know they're, there was uh, television programs, movies, and, and actual stories about people after the war, Jews and non-Jews, who went to get their tormentors and, 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 and disposed of them, killed them. Uh, Max has a different view about what trying to take hate out of his life is. What, what does it mean, to, as you understand it? Yeah, it's not that Max wants to excuse the actions that the Nazis perpetrated or excuse what happened in the Holocaust. But when we think about people, Max doesn't believe that hatred is pr productive. In fact, he believes it's futile because he says that he thinks the person who holds the hate inside of them hurt, is hurt more than the person who they're hating. And it's a really powerful idea and one that I think someone with Max's life experience can express with a moral authority that I don't feel like I can, although I can relay what he means by it in the sense that Max, he just feels so strongly that there is no place for hate in this world. There's no place for it in revenge or, or any other form because he believes that ultimately understanding each other's differences and understanding how we can play our small parts in creating more unity and love and understanding in the world, and he believes education is a key factor to that, is really what's going to move us forward. And I think he kind of feels like the same way he didn't want to move somewhere after the war that was embroiled in war because he felt like he had enough war in his life or more than enough war experience in his life. I think he, ex he feels he's had more than enough hatred and the impact of it in his life and he wants to eradicate it. Well, is, is his view of hate 
removing the toxicity from your own personality or I know there, uh, an important Christian concept is forgiveness is hate, removing hate and forgiveness and, and the notable examples in the history of the United States in the past few years when uh, the killings in uh, the church in uh, Charleston, uh, South Carolina and, and also in the Amish country, some members of, of the congregation went and said, we forgive you to the killer. What, what is his concept of hate and how does it relate to forgiveness if at all? Yeah, it's a good question and a, and a complicated one, but I think what I would say is that I think Max just, he doesn't believe the hatred can help him. So yes, I guess removing the toxicity from his heart would be really at the core of it. And I don't think he is focused on forgiving the Nazis, but I think he's focused on not letting them take more from him than they already have. And so he can try and move forward and try and use his testimony for purpose. And if he can't change the pain he experienced, how can he at least transform it into purpose? So rather than sitting with that negativity and pain and hatred, channeling it more positively. And so Max comes to the United States and what happens to him here? I mean, a big part of your book is, is the aftermath. Uh, and one thing, he marries a, a, a woman, a Jewish woman who's born and raised in the United States, and she's marrying somebody who's got a lot of baggage. And nowadays, how many children and grandchildren, and great-grandchildren do they have? Yeah, they now have three children, seven grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren, which is so powerful. And, and Max, it just means so much to him. That, that was one of the things he would tell himself in the concentration camps, is the Nazis want to get rid of my family and my family name, and I'm not going to let them. And so now to have four generations of Globin, who they celebrated his grandson's birthday with a couple weeks ago, is so powerful. He said, I think, 20 people in his family. And, you know, there's the oft-quoted comment from the Talmud about if you save one life, you save the world. You save a world. Uh, Max achieved that. Yes, and he, and he, he uses that line. He, he says that, and he's proud of it, and it's one of the reasons why he believes that um, he says religion is in your heart, and he's like, look how much I've already done trying to save one life and create, allow the impact he's made individually and the impact his family can make moving I, forward. And when he gets to the United States, he's drafted into the U.S. Army. Yes, he what is. What happened? What is he? What? Why was? What age was he at that point, and what did he do? So, what age Max is has always been a complicated question because he was born in 1928. He had to lie and say he was older so that he would be deemed. Um, old enough and fit enough to work in the concentration camps. And then he said he was younger when he got to the States so that he wasn't too old for the Orphan Act under 18. Um, but I believe he was 18 by his American passport and, and 20. Um, chronologically. Eight, yeah, chronologically. Um, and yeah, and, and really Max wanted to serve this country, a place that he felt like he had experienced freedom. Um, and he, he, I think it was almost it really enabled him to have a sense of purpose, to take the skills he had used as a mess sergeant in Germany and apply them in the mess halls of Fort Hood, Texas on the, on the military base. Um, and he, he chose to. And there's sort of an irony, and eventually he ends up a career working for Neiman Marcus as a buyer. And of all things, he's a buyer of toys. Which actually, before Max decided to dedicate his life to, I guess, commemorating and educating about the Holocaust, he had told his wife, Frida, that he wanted to make toys for kids who don't have um, once he retired because, and that was really what he thought about as a toy buyer too, is that toys in a childhood were deprived from him and he wanted to recapture that and ensure that others could recapture it too. And uh, when did he start going around and, and speaking about, uh, about his uh, experiences? Yeah, so what, what's amazing is that Max was in the States by late 1947 and really didn't speak about his experience at all until late 70s, picking up a little bit more into the in the 80s. And as the decades have advanced, he's spoken about it more. He first went back to the concentration camps with the March of the Living program in 2005. He's now been back to the camps in Poland 14 times and to Germany, I believe, seven times um, for educational purposes. But he really didn't speak about it at all because at first he said he wanted to make sure he could establish his life in America. Um, he didn't really talk to his kids about it much as they were growing up because he's like, I want to have a straight parenthood. And he felt like if he told them what he had survived, 
then if he got mad at them, they would feel like they couldn't get mad back if he disciplined them or something otherwise. So that was one of the most fascinating things for me to discover that I really was not expecting when we started this project is um, when you experience this trauma, how do you process it? Who, to whom do you tell it? And when do you tell it? Um, and, and Max's sons told me, they're like, when, when we're 20 years old and hearing our father speak at an event, we're emotionally numb as if this is something we felt like we should know but didn't. Now, Max is, is a diminutive person physically, right? Yes. <laughs> He's five foot. Five two, roughly. Five two. Maybe not anymore. And he in was. 2019, <laughs> he was given the high, a high honor that doesn't fit in with, the, with, with the, the notion. He was made what? Yeah, in 2019, the Dallas Morning News um, named Max their Texan of the Year, an award I think he followed Laura Bush in receiving it. And it was so powerful, and it meant so much to him because— they were saying that what we think encapsulates a Texan is someone who wants to create light and darkness, who wants to create civility among the discord we have, and who wants to de who's dedicating their life to combating hate. And I mean, he is very proud of it. I have been out to dinner with him when he'll tell our server, "Did you know that I'm the Texan of the year?" <laughs> Which they do now. <laughs> now, after listening to you, why should people read your book? Why should people read the book? Well, I think that, as, as I mentioned a little bit, I just feel so honored and privileged to have the insight, that, that Max has shared this insight with me, and that he's done it in such a meaningful way, and really trying to, we really want to create this blueprint for Holocaust education for my generation. Um, but I think when you read the book, just like when you meet Max, you really get a sense of who he is. Um, Max is quoted on almost every page of the book, and that's intentional because my job was to create this framework for the story that he's told so powerfully and so meaningfully for decades. Um, I think that reading it, you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll understand um, things about humanity beyond the Holocaust experience and with direct relation to the Holocaust experience. And, and one thing that Max said when, we, when I started, because I, I read the book aloud to Max when I finished the manuscript, because he reads more slow, even though he speaks beautifully, he never had formal training in reading English. And one of the things he said to me, which meant so much, was that um, for decades he had trained himself to dissociate his emotions from his lectures as a coping mechanism. He's like, I needed to be an educator, almost an actor, where what he was saying was true and he remembered it, but he wasn't speaking about the emotions so much as the facts because it was too much. Um, and I guess we had reached a point in Max's lifetime where he was willing to share that with me. Um, and now we are willing and want to share that with y'all. Um, and so I think to really have that emotion of what Max felt during the war and what he feels now is really powerful and something that will all be, I, I know I'm daily, in, daily inspired by it and I think y'all will be too. Y'all. <laughs> the, uh, I think now would be a good time to see what questions uh, members of, of the audience here have and, uh, and, and what direction you'd like the conversation to go. And if you could say your name too, it's always meaningful when we know. Who Hi, my name is Bill Boschnick. So um, after you read the book to, to Max and after it was published, has he gotten back to you and said, you know, I forgot to put this one thing in there. I want you to know this one thing. So do you now feel compelled you have to release a second edition. It, it's such a great... Did you repeat the question? Because I didn't hear Yes, it. the question was, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was after I had read the book to Max, and now that it's been published, has have more memories come to him that he said, let's add this, or I forgot that, um, that we now want a second edition of the book. Um, I feel like you were sitting there with me when I read the book to him, if you're asking this <laughs> question, because that was actually something that was so powerful and, and so confirming when I read it to him that, one, what I was reading to him, he was almost, you could like see as he closed his eyes at the dining room table, these memories replaying in his head, um, but also that he would say, okay, yes, my mom and I made cherry wine together at home before uh, Passover when we were growing up, but here's actually the contraption we used. And like he was correcting and, and improving the descriptions of such specific things that you're like, when I think about someone who's questioning whether he remembers it, it's like, how could you possibly be making this up? It, it is so powerful how deeply he remembered it. So I wouldn't say that now there have been so many things that have, have come out differently, but I think that that was what was powerful about our reporting process was 
I started by reading an oral history that Max had done with a local university in 1990. And then I also went, th and I read that maybe two or three times, taking all these notes, trying as if I'm studying for a test, trying to just master this material. And then, okay, Max had done oral histories with the Holocaust Museum in 2015 and, two th uh, yeah, 2015 was the next one. And so what I was doing is taking that and then just going portion by portion, asking Max these questions. So what Michael was almost that the upstander is the second edition based off the first editions that he had been lecturing about for decades and that um, he had shared in some of these oral histories. And I'm so grateful. I think we're, we all stand on shoulders of giants in these projects for the, uh, the, or, the oral historian who had interviewed him in 1990 because yes, Max remembered a lot of, it wasn't that Max had forgotten it, but I might not have known the right questions to ask if I didn't have some of these documents. What, what is your generation, uh, whether Jew or non-Jew, uh, know about the Holocaust uh, as you go around talking to people? Do they think, why are you writing about that, or, or isn't that interesting, or yeah, I don't know any, anything, I don't know Kristallnacht, I don't know the Holocaust, I don't know, what, what's, what's the kind of uh, information you get from your generation? Your, a number of generations removed from the events. Yeah, I think it would be hard to generalize um, because I think people have such different experiences. I don't think that people have personally told me they didn't know what the Holocaust was, although I imagine because I have been promoting this on the channels I promote my Dallas Cowboys news on, um, that there are people who didn't have that life experience. I think most of them um, latch on to the inspiration Max is able to provide because even if they don't know specifically about what happened in the Holocaust, um, we've all experienced or known someone who's experienced severe trauma and they, they just are really inspired by how, again, when you have these videos of Max and you see kind of like his twinkling blue eyes and his smile and, and the humor he's made, seeing someone who has been through so much with that kind of joy I think has really resonated with people across the age gender and religious spectrum. But it has meant a lot to me and it means a lot seeing it here tonight um, that my friends and family and, and people I know who are not Jewish have, have showed interest in this topic too because um, I remember, I can't remember who it was. Someone in this process had wanted us to specifically promote this only through Jewish channels. And I'm like, we would not be doing our jobs justice because if we're only internally concerned about how we make the world a better place, um, I don't think we're we're going to get where we need to go. Now, granted, I think we have to take on the responsibility ourselves, um, but I think that, I know there's one idea that the former chief rabbi of England, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs said, which is the idea of the dignity of difference, um, that each of us in our different religions and communities and backgrounds can bring with us to our community um, the best that we can, we can offer and how powerful that is. And I think that that's what we want people to see is that the Holocaust was the opposite of that and trying to stifle it in Kristallnacht particularly, both in the physical assault and murder, but also with the book burnings in the synagogues. I mean, when I think about the fact that I woke up this morning and prayed with the Hebrew prayer book on the streets outside my brother's apartment here, and I wasn't afraid to do that, and that we're having this event in a synagogue tonight, and that um, I'm going through things about the upstander on the plane over here. I mean, those ideas and that we're able to live with them freely, we need to continue to have these interfaith conversations. I want to ask you about two words, Glauben, which is Max's last name, and upstander. Glauben in Yiddish and in German means belief. And when I asked you about that uh, uh, a, few day, a few weeks ago, a week or two ago, you said Max had suggested maybe believe. What does Max believe besides, uh, what, what's, what's the totality of his belief system? Yeah, I think that, yeah, Max, Max, it means a lot to him that his name translates to believe because he believes his belief is something that has helped sustain him throughout this experience. He, believe, he believes, one question we get a lot when we do programs like this is, um, does Max believe in God, and if so, how? Um, and I think it's a fair question, but what Max says is he believes in free will, and he doesn't believe that God committed the Holocaust, he believes humans do, and so how is he to blame God? And he believes that God saved him and the other survivors with this mission to share their testimony. Does that mean that we can't struggle with God? No, I think we can, and I, I find it powerful that we're in a religion where constantly struggling and trying to understand is what we stand for. Um, but Max does believe in God. He believes he survived so that he could share his testimony. And he believes uh, strongly that it's his mission to create upstanders. All right. Well, the word upstander, uh, 
I looked it up on the internet. <laughs> it was a 17th century, or 17th, yeah. maybe even earlier, then it was revived by Ambassador, UN, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., uh, Samantha Powers. Uh, why did you pick it for the title? What does it mean when you're presenting it in the book, The Upstander? It's not, it's not the uh, go-to phrase. People know bystander, but they don't know upstander. Yeah, the upstander is a term that Max has really taken on as his own for decades now and that the Dallas Holocaust Museum, which he works closely with, does as well. And just this idea that we have a choice to be a bystander or an upstander. Um, and I think that it really gives the power to our readers of this book and to the people in our community that each of us individually can be that upstander. And we have inside us what we need to, whether it's make a difference in the world or stand up for what we believe in or just do something, even if it's something small, to try and make our personal, professional, and societal worlds a little bit more positive and, and unified. And, and that's what Max wants to inspire people to do. Well, um, I think in your book you mentioned a couple of people who are not Jewish who helped out Max, and it's always been a puzzlement to me, the people who, who, who are not Jewish, who, who saved uh, Jews and, and hit them because the consequence would be their death and the death of their families. Does Max talk about, uh, 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 he didn't have that, he wasn't a hidden person, so it probably doesn't fall within his range of uh, experiences, but did, did he talk at all about the, the, the righteous Gentile uh, as, as it's called in Israel and so forth? Yeah, I would say it's less directly about his experience, but that's one of the reasons I found our Crystal Knopf reading tonight so powerful is because we do think about that and we do have people from y'all's communities who risk your lives to save our communities. And I mean, that gives me chills just to say because it's such a powerful gesture. And I think what was the, the wording we had about understanding that the reasons for life are even more powerful than life itself, I think was roughly the wording in the service. Um, and I think... It's just an incredible show of humanity and the epitome of being an upstander. Well, there were quotes in the program from people yeah. who had risked their lives to, to save Jews. Um, other questions? Yes. Upstander. Jory can't promote it directly, but I can. <laughs> it really is, and I've been a member of several book clubs. It is a very, very good book, and it's not too long, and it creates a picture of a person and a history and a, and a situation that is well worth reading. I've read the book twice now, second time because Jory invited me to be the moderator, but it was, uh, I learned a lot more, a lot more, a lot more in addition the second time I read it. Uh, thank you, Jory. Um, I'm, my name's also Max. I'm curious uh, about your day job and whether the folks in the Dallas Cowboys organization uh, are aware of your book and appreciate it. Um, and also, at this evening, you've been sharing a lot of Max's mindset. I'm curious from a, a writing and reporting standpoint if there's similarities between, you know, relaying his mindset and maybe, you know, Dak Prescott's mindset as he battles adversity, et cetera. Yeah, it's a great question. So for those who didn't hear, um, the question was about my job as an NFL reporter, whether there are similarities in Max's mindset and some of the Cowboys' mindset, um, and whether any of the Cowboys are aware of it. So, um, yes, I've, ha I've actually had conversations with some coaches, some players, um, and some agents about the book, and it, it's meant so much to me um, what their reaction has been, both when I've talked about my Jewish experience, which I think is important, I'll explain why in a second, and Max's testimony. Actually, there was a game I traveled to recently where I went, I went to meet one of the player's agents afterwards, and he was at the game, he's not Jewish, um, and he was at the game with his four children and his wife, and the way he introduced me was, this is Jory, she's the Cowboys reporter for USA Today, and she wrote an incredible story about a man named Max, can you tell my kids about Max? Um, and that's what, I, that just meant so much to me that that's what people care about. Um, and it's just like so inspiring to me that there has been that level of interest. Um, and there, there was one of the players who I had spoken with a lot about my Jewish experiences and he'd asked a lot of questions who I gave a copy to. Um, it, there's kind of like a, Max likes to tell me probably every week or twice a week that if Jerry Jones wants to buy copies of the book for everyone to let, Ma let him know that Max is okay with that. Um, there are some conflict of interest uh, questions there that have not led me to start that conversation, but um, it has meant a lot to me, and I think that 
One, um, a lot of the players I work with, though I would never try and conflate their experiences with what Max survived, because I don't think comparing trauma is helpful for anyone, have been through some really challenging things. I mean, a player like Dak Prescott, the Cowboys quarterback, lost his mom to cancer in college, um, his brother to suicide last year, has battled anxiety, depression, um, severe physical injuries, and so has he experienced what Max experienced and vice versa? No, but has he had to overcome a lot of adversity and used his adversity like Max to transform his pain into purpose? I actually, I'm trying to remember that might, that wording might be something that Dak said before we started using it. Um, yeah, he has, and I think that it's just sort of a reminder that all of the different corners of life we come through, what really is common or uniform um, is the humanity that we bring to it. Um, and I think also when I think about um, the anti-Semitism that does still exist today. I kind of feel responsible as an observant Jew in the sports world, interacting with a lot of guys who, have they met someone who's Jewish before? Probably. Have they met someone who's talking openly about practicing their Judaism? Maybe not. Um, to sort of represent our community and show them we're not some other. And then maybe if there is some uh, anti-Semitic comment they hear somewhere else, it's well, you're saying that about the Jewish community like there's some other, but Jory's not like that. And again, I, I'm not by no means perfect, and I probably could do an even better job, but I think that it is a really powerful opportunity when, when I work with them, and so I'm, I'm definitely grateful um, to have those conversations and to work with players and coaches who care so much about the human experience that that's something that resonates with them, too. Hi, Jory. Thanks so much for doing this for all of us. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about your friendship with Max personally, apart from you know, you interviewing him for the book, apart from the purpose of the book for education, you know, education reasons, if you can just talk to us about, you know, this friendship that you've developed with uh, such a special person, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, the question from Rachel is to talk about my friendship with Max and the relationship we've developed. Um, I say that Max is one of my best friends. Um, I probably talk to him as much or more as most of my friends. And we know about as much as each, about each other as most of my friends and I know about each other. And it's a really unique friendship. I mean, we're 66 and a half years apart. I love when I'll, I'll talk to my grandmother um, who's in her 80s. And I'm like, Nana, you're the fourth or oldest person I talked to on the phone today. <laughs> Make her feel young. But, um, but I, it's really special. I think that that's something that I've learned is so key to to the reporting process, but it's about more than reporting, but that, but I think from a storytelling standpoint, if Max and I didn't trust about each other and care about each other beyond what this book meant, this wouldn't have worked. Um, and I think that as Rachel, you know, from spending time with Max, um, Max is just so warm and caring. He's funny. He likes to hum and sing and crack jokes and um, he'll tell me, I mean, he'll call me and be like, if you go to Trader Joe's today, you can get four artichokes for $3. And like, that's really important for me to know. Um, and, and say things like that, which again is not the, maybe the impression that someone who hasn't met a Holocaust survivor is thinking of, but that's who Max is, is just this care and concern. There were times um, throughout this book writing process where I would be nervous um, about how we were going to find a publisher, how I was going to put all these pieces and Max's incredible life together. And Max would tell me, you've already baked the cake, the rest is icing. Um, and just always inspiring and encouraging. And, and then or he would tell me if I was a little bit stressed about it, like, I can hear you're not smiling and I'm not hanging up the phone until you're smiling, <laughs> which I, I don't know how he has that sense of humanity, but he does. Um, and, it, and there have been plenty of funny moments too. I try not to call Max too late, but he never goes to sleep it seems so I'll get calls from him at 10 30 11 at night where you would think it was like crap like middle of the day and that he was not 93 years old because he's just got so much energy um one of the most memorable being this past new year's eve um covid I was home really exciting new year's but um I get an email at like 11.20 on New Year's Eve, Max Globin is in your Zoom waiting room. And I'm like, what is he doing up much less in my Zoom waiting room? But he just wanted to say hello. And I guess he found an old Zoom link from when, one of our previous conversations. And we ended up chatting. And then it's, I look at the, the clock in the corner of the screen and it's 12.03 and I'm like, happy 2021, Max. Um, but I think that, again, that's the Max that I want y'all to know. That's the Max that I want to be able to share with the world because I just feel so honored to have had that experience getting to know um, who he is in such a, a deeply human and powerful way. Hi, my name is Dan Binstock. Um, I've got a 
comment and a question. I think I probably speak for everyone in this room when I say that you're so incredibly impressive. Just poise the way that you speak. It's just, you give me um, hope for the next generations in terms of what you've just, what you bring here. Um, my question is, what advice for the, uh, the children here in confirmation who are 15, what's the advice that you would give to your own 15-year-old self that you would want them to learn from you? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, thank you so much. And for those who didn't hear, um, the question was, what advice would I give to my 15-year-old self for the 15-year-olds in confirmation class who are here? Um, I think one thing I would say is, as it relates specifically to the Holocaust and Max's testimony, if it sounds like it's a lot, it is. Um, when I went on this trip at 17, I was numb. I was shocked. I, I, I remember being like concerned that I wasn't crying, but this, that's how the shock hits you. And I understand this is a challenging topic, but I think that it's one that one, I think all of y'all are, are stronger and more capable than you might think you are. I think you are. Um, and that if we just start to try and understand how we can do our part moving this world forward and creating unity and realizing that each person, and one of my favorite things is I feel like every single person has something to teach me and something for us to learn from. And I think that to me, although it's a little bit tangential, is really what this story is about is that um, after six million of our people and millions of others were killed because their humanity wasn't recognized and their um, decision to have uniqueness and to express who they were and what they believed in wasn't acceptable, um, the more we can try and understand who people are, the better. And it's such a powerful experience. And to me, it's exciting too. Yes, it can, it doesn't have to feel like this heavy weight or burden of um, how are we going to carry on this legacy? I think it can instead be one thing Max says is, um, for the people we lost, let's live life for them. And so it's not about constantly every day struggling with what this mass murder means. It's no understanding the incredible opportunities we have to live the type of life we wish people were living in the, in the 30s and 40s. Do, do you uh, have any insight as to why uh, there are groups that deny the existence of the Holocaust? Like I read something recently from uh, somebody said, well, it wasn't six million, it was only four million. Like th somehow that makes it better. But uh, people who say, well, it didn't happen, it's exaggerated, the Jews have just taken it over and made it into a, into a, um, a, 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 an effort for sympathy. Yeah, I mean, I definitely can't explain them. Um, I hope none of us can, because I don't think we should be able to explain something so absurd as that. Um, what Max's response when he's had Holocaust deniers at his lectures is to say, in his words, um, that he's glad he lives in a, free in, a, in a country where people have the freedom to speak and show people how stupid they are. That's what he says, <laughs> which again, if you've met Max, you would know that's very on brand. Um, but I think that, I think one, we can keep trying to change their minds and that to me is a powerful challenge. And two, I mean, I think that history tells us, and it's funny, uh, I took a class on anti-Semitism in history and literature in college six years ago, which Uncle David actually sat in on once and remembers incredibly well. But one of the things that we, we talked about was there, we, we really never historically have eradicated hatred and really anti-Semitism is always at the core. I think it, it's often the start. And so even though we would like to, I think what's more important to me is, I, I guess, how can we continue to try and create this education? Because I think that there's malice and there's ignorance. Uh, malice is probably harder to thwart, but ignorance has a a fairly doable beginning of a solution, and that to me is education. Right, Jory, I think you said you first met Max when you were 17, and you spent five years working on this book. I think some people are gonna wanna know how old you are. I am 27, last I checked. <laughs> uh, is, is this, uh, are there more questions? Well, I guess now that Jory has revealed her age. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, we want to thank Jory Epstein for, for being with us tonight. So if we can give her a round of applause. And also David Epstein for, uh, for sharing, for, for leading this and moderating this conversation so beautifully. Certainly a conversationalist as your bio <laughs> described, but now we all know that that's true. Thank um, you. And, and, uh, and Jory, thank you for sharing Max's story with us. Just a reminder, you can, um, when we, we leave the sanctuary, 
there's an opportunity for you to, to purchase The Upstander. I encourage you to do that, not just because this is a program with the Jewish Book Council, but really because Max's story is, um, is moving and inspiring, and a large part of that inspiration is the relationship, Jory, that you share with him and the way that that's expressed on the pages of the book. And it's a reminder to us uh, the importance of those relationships and, and listening to the stories and sharing those stories. Uh, I know that that's something our, our confirmants were able to, to listen earlier tonight to Rosalind Spray Reagan, and we hope again to our confirmants that that's a conversation you'll be able to have again and again to, to hear additional pieces of Rosalind's story. And we thank you for, for being with us as you are every year. Um, and Jory, uh, thank you for inspiring all of us with uh, even, even more importantly, Max's story is, is moving and inspiring in itself, uh, but the way in which you share it and reminding us to be upstanders uh, and the importance of moving forward as we commemorate tonight in this uh, opportunity for us to come together as an interfaith community um, but also to, to move forward in a world that certainly is in need of more upstanders. I, I hope that our confirmands are inspired. I know their parents are, they, some of them shared with me, and I know for our students, we're going to continue to talk about ways that we can be upstanders throughout this year as you make your, your commitment to Judaism your own and you confirm uh, what you've learned, not just tonight, but over your life. And we hope that this, this is an inspirational story that will inspire you to think about how to act and how to be in this world. So could be no better way for us to share that with our confirmands than by having you share your own experience, inspiring them to perhaps go out and do the same. So thank you to everyone for, for being here. Uh, I, we invite you to join us in the lobby. Uh, and also we invite you as you leave to please, um, to please take a, a tulip bulb as well. You can read a little bit more about that in the booklet. I want to thank our, our partners from St. Albans Episcopal Church, uh, Reverend Emily Griffin, uh, Reverend Joymel Gonzalez Hernandez, and uh, Deacon Bill Maximek. Did I get it right again? Well, oh, without it even in front of me, from the Church of the Annunciation. And we thank you for, for being our partners, for being present tonight, for bearing witness as well, and bringing these stories back to your community. Thank you, everyone. Good night.